respiratory system, this very much ties in with the circulatory system that we did last week. Right. Remember the circulatory system was about the heart and the pathways that blood takes through your body and it's about how blood carries oxygen and carbon dioxide and this body system, the respiratory system, is really about how your body gets those um, chemicals that it needs. So how do we get oxygen into your blood, how do you get oxygen around your body and how do we get carbon dioxide out of our body. All right. So, same as the other three body systems, I've got written down for you to use the videos, diagrams, and me now talking to be able to describe human respiration to start with. Towards the end, I will actually talk about a couple of different organisms as well that have quite different respiration, but really, to begin with, I'm interested in you understanding human respiration. Now, to my knowledge, you have done some of this in HPE. Yes? Okay. So some of it should just be a refresher. So there's a video, I'm not going to play that for you now. Uh, for the respiratory system, there's some major things that we would like you to know and be able to identify. So the first one is obviously you have your nasal cavity, which is from your nose and your oral cavity. Basically they are pathways for things to get into your body. Actually breathing incidental things like dust, and things that you don't want in your body, your nose to start with is quite good at trapping things. So the first thing that you have are nose hairs. They are basically there to filter out any things that sort of shouldn't go into your body because remember, that is just an opening into your inside. And then you also have mucus. So when you get snot, a lot of the times that is there to trap things. You blow your nose and you actually get rid of the bad stuff. Interestingly, there was a study into, and they haven't actually got to a definitive answer to my knowledge, about why little kids insist on um, picking their nose and then eating it. Okay, if any of you ever seen how little kids do that? They'll sort of pick their nose and then their hands go near their mouth. Um, we don't know why. Why is that not good for you to do? Why is it not good to eat your own snot? There is actually a reason why. Perfect. It's there to trap the bad stuff, so you don't want it getting into your body. It's really sort of a silly thing to do, but a lot of kids tend to do it. We're not quite sure why. Um, after that, you have your pharynx and your larynx. Now, if you've ever heard of people having laryngitis, where they lose their voice, your larynx is your voice box. Your pharynx is above that. It's actually the part, if you remember back to when I talked in the digestive system about your epiglottis, you have that little trap door, do you remember that? Okay, so basically the pharynx is the part that it's still food will go past it. You don't want food going down past your larynx into your trachea. So at the top you have your epiglottis that comes across like a trap door. Your esophagus is for food going to your stomach. Your trachea is for gases coming in and out. You don't want to get food trapped in your lungs. That's really bad. If you accidentally get like decent stuff stuck in your lungs, it is not easy for people to get it out. Like it can result in surgery to have to get it out. It's not, that's not a great thing to do. So your body's very good at trying to stop food going down into your lungs. So from there, so like I said, your trachea, when we dissect a pluck, you'll be able to feel it. It's a lot stiffer, so don't push too hard. But if you feel at the front of your throat, you can feel it's quite solid in there. That is cartilage, that's not skeleton, it's not bone. And the reason it's quite stiff is because you don't want to bend your neck and cut your windpipe. You don't want to be able to cut it off. So it's got to be quite rigid, all right? Um, so from there, it goes down and it goes into your bronchi, into your lungs. Now, in your lungs, you have a very important part called your alveoli. This is important. I'll go into it in a little bit more detail in a minute. The last big thing I want to show you on this Diagram. Oh, and remember we talked about the fact your left lung's a little bit smaller because your heart sits in behind it, and you actually see that with the pluck. But the last big thing I wanted to show you on this diagram is this huge muscle here, which is your diaphragm. Now, people that are in singing and things like that, people get taught, anyone can here do singing, and you get taught a little bit to control your diaphragm. It's about getting oxygen into your lungs and having a longer, I think it's to do with singing a longer note, isn't it? Something like that. 
Now, this little model here, I'll hand around in a minute. This is a model of lungs, and the bottom here is rubber. This is representing your diaphragm. And what actually happens, without me having any mechanical things up here, if I pull down on the diaphragm, the lungs get air in them. Because what's happening is that pulling down motion is causing through physics the air to get sucked down and into the lungs. So when your diaphragm goes down, your lungs fill up. When it goes up, they go down. Okay, so I'll hand this around in a minute and you can have a look at this. Maybe take a photo of it if you want to. Um, but when the diaphragm goes down, the lungs inflate. When it goes up, so it's like breathing in, breathing out. So all to do with your diaphragm, a very big muscle. I also have this lung model that I'll hand around so you can have a look at possibly what this looks like inside. You'll definitely feel next week when we have the pluck, for as much as this is quite soft and spongy, there is actually pieces when you touch inside that you can feel quite solid. Because you've got to remember we want these pathways open for gases getting in and out. So I'll pass this one around as well. No, so it does sort of sound like plucking a chicken, but no, a pluck is basically something we get, we can dissect that has the tongue, the trachea, the lungs, it often, you get it with a heart attached, um, liver, usually we get it from a pig or it will be probably from a sheep. And what we can do is we can blow up the pump, um, blow up the lungs with a bike pump so you can see. They actually change colour quite a lot when they've got air in them. And they go very, very big if we can do it, hopefully. Uh, yes? In the experiment, do we pump up the lungs and blow up the can you get them to explode? You can't, you, we, it, it, they won't actually explode like that because you'd have to have it totally sealed and, and, and that sort of thing with the trachea. So there's still going to be stuff coming in and out. And you'll find when we try and pump them up, it will be pretty constant to get them to stay up. Um, I would say only about one in every three blow up both lungs really, really well because there'll be little nicks in it. Um, so we will try and block those. But once you can do it, it's really good. And then what we'll do is we'll actually um, sort of poke them with a scalpel. Because anyone who watched the football on the weekend, does anyone know what happened to a player in the NRL on the weekend? So a guy actually got tackled and the way that someone um, fell on him, it broke his rib and punctured his lung. So he had to go to hospital because that's a really big deal because what happens is if you actually puncture your lung, your lungs are still quite solid, but if you puncture them, they will fill with blood from your body, which means you can't get air into them, which, yeah, which isn't good. So, and that's actually partly what they believe happened to a lot of the people at Pompeii. So a lot of the people, when the volcano erupted in Pompeii, a lot of ash and dust went into the air and people breathed an awful lot of it in. So probably for as much as people got buried by the rubble coming from the volcano, their lungs would have actually been filled with really fine soot and dust and they probably would have choked on that essentially. Um, I mean, like, if you're in water, mm -hmm. like you get water into your lungs, doesn't that go to like ideology? Yes, so that, that's essentially what's happening with drowning. And that's why as well, your body's really good. Probably more common than food is accidentally having liquids go into your trachea. And that's why you get really good at trying to cough it back out. Your body's natural defense is to try and, and get it out yourself. Um, and, and with scuba diving and things too, people talk about getting the bends because you've got gas in your body. And if you go down deep in the water, um, there's pressure acting on you. Because if you think about it, in terms of physics, if you have a whole bucket of water, think about how heavy that is. And when you swim down and down in a pool or down in the sea, you've got all that water on you from every angle. And that's why your body wants to let air out the further down you go. And there is a limit to how far humans can dive without being in a submarine. Uh, because your body just can't handle the pressure and keep your gases at the right levels. So after, after having a look at the diagram, I gave you that one to colour in the other day. There's a couple, there's a good video here on how your lungs work. I liked including this diagram because it just reminded you that this is really, the lungs are integral in your circulatory system, the whole double pump system with the heart. Your lungs play a very important role. So this is your alveoli. Now these are really tiny 
in your lungs. And what they do, they're surrounded by capillaries. If you remember from the other day, capillaries are the really small pathways for blood. Remember we talked about arteries, veins, and capillaries. So capillaries are often only one blood cell thick. And why that's really important is they surround your alveoli and the gas gets into your blood from the alveoli into your capillary. So into your blood that's surrounding the alveoli in your lungs. So you basically, you want to get oxygen into your blood and carbon dioxide out. If we go back even further to when we first learnt about cells, this is why your red blood cells are the only cell without a nucleus because their job, they replace pretty quickly, but their job is carrying carbon dioxide and oxygen. So the alveoli are in your lungs. So here's another picture. So you've got your bronchi, bronchioles with the little alveoli, the air sacs on the end, surrounded by capillaries. And the capillaries have blood flowing through them, and we've got the red and blue again. Remember we talked about you don't have blue blood, but when oxygenated, we show it with red, carbon dioxide. So it's that constant pathway of in and out with oxygen and carbon dioxide. Because if you remember back, so surface area in your body is really important. So remember when we learned about your small intestine and it's got the villi to increase the surface area for nutrients to get in? Same thing, by having your alveoli have this shape that they're in and out, you're increasing the surface that can get oxygen and carbon dioxide to your blood. So you don't just have the bronchi stopping in straight lines, you've got this in and out surface so there's lots of surface area. Um, but yeah, there is, there is some uh, statistical number out there you can look up about if you actually flattened out the surface area of the lungs, it's, it's actually really huge what it would cover. So surface area, really important, okay? Um, so this one here, this is just an actual, this is someone, uh, a doctor did a proper CT scan of lungs. So you could, that's actual thing. You can sort of see here where the heart would sit in behind, nice and clear. So that's, you can have a close look. Um, this is a good video on how oxygen flows through your body, how breathing works. This one here was just to highlight again your diaphragm. When your diaphragm goes down, oxygen's drawn in. When it goes up, it's going out, carbon dioxide. So there's a good image there. Uh, this one is a bit more, this is an extension video with a bit more in depth, especially if you're into possibly like sports science. This is a good video for you to watch. I have this nice diagram again that you can have a look at. It's got some interesting facts. Uh, PowerPoint and there's some extra, this is quite a good little website here on the respiratory system. And it's got some things that you can click on. So if you, let's say we want to see about the lungs, I can go in here and you can start, you can click on, let's see, introduction, anatomy of the lungs. So if you want to have a look a little bit more at what happens and you can click through these and it will change and label, label things and all sorts of stuff. So it's actually a good little website if you would like to learn some more. Now, in terms of comparing um, comparing respiratory systems, the two other animals I just wanted to highlight to you that are quite different to us in some ways and in other ways they're not. Um, fish particularly, do fish breathe the same way we do? No. no. So did you guys dissect, some of you did, um, dissected fish in the past and even in primary school? One, one person dissected fish and yeah. the other person dissected fish. Okay, so when you look at fish, or if you've ever even been fishing, when you've been fishing, fish have gills. Often when you look into gills, they're quite red because it's a lot of the blood flows there. The same idea, fish are breathing oxygen just like we do. But they get the oxygen into their body through their gills and they get the oxygen out of water. So obviously it's not the amount that we have, but they're actually usually smaller bodied unless you're getting up into really big sharks. And they have to get the oxygen out of the water. This is why environmentally it's very important that we look at waterways that we put fertilizer and things into, 
because a lot of the oxygen in water comes from the sea plants and things that are in water and if water gets too hot oxygen levels go lower and then you can have fish dying off so um, oxygen really important in waterways if you go on to do environmental science and looking at water one of the bigger things you look at in ecosystems is the amount of oxygen in water because it's about healthy ecosystems um, and like I said, we can have issues here where we have lots of fertiliser that flows off and leads to an abundance of certain sorts of plants or choking of waterways and things. But having a look, going back to this, having a look at how fish particularly get their oxygen through their gills. This is a very good little video. And the other animal I wouldn't mind you having a look at uh, is the same down here having oh this was just a good little picture of fish and their gills and how they get the water needs to flow over it and how they trap oxygen but if you have a look again same sort of thing it's all about flowing blood okay all about flowing blood and getting that oxygen in and the other animals that are super interesting to have a look at are insects especially animals like grasshoppers because they basically have little air sacs and, and openings to the outside along their body um, which is quite interesting to have a look at. Okay, um, so the next thing down here, there's some questions for you to do from the textbook. I'm more interested in you focusing on the human respiratory system, but if you do want to have a look at these animals, particularly the fish, I would encourage you to have a look.